Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Easy Power Thursday webinar series. My name is Jim Chastain. I'm an applications engineer here at Easy Power and host for today's presentation. Uh, our presenter today is a, uh, a longtime friend of Easy Power, Mr. Brian McFadden of Graphic Products. Before we introduce him, I'd like to uh, run a few poll questions as we are in the habit of doing. And uh, clearly there's no obligation or liability, but we would like to uh, have you participate by providing some feedback. The first question is where do the most detailed requirements for arc flash labels come from? We'll see how up to speed everyone is. No liability or obligation, but we do appreciate the feedback. We have a fairly large audience today and uh, we appreciate your time and, and attendance. So it looks like we're getting close to a quorum. Let's leave this open for another 10 seconds. Please respond accordingly. Yeah, that looks like we're close. So here's how folks have weighed in on this one. Looks like a pretty good distribution. We'll find out during the presentation how this works out. Next question is which elements are not required on an NFPA 70E? I mistyped my label. <laughs> so let's see if you can do better on the questions. Which elements are not required on an NFPA 70E compliant arc flash label? Now, admittedly, this is some tricky information, so I, I won't be surprised if we get a good spread of uh, thoughts here. So it looks like we're about halfway to a quorum. We'll, he'll leave it open for another uh, 15 seconds. All right, here's how folks have weighed in. All right, looks like we have a heavy favorite. We'll see how that fits into the equation. Let's see how my typing is on the third question. So has your organization, how has your organization gotten its arc flash labels in the past? And frankly, I'm a, very curious about this because I don't know that there's a, a clear line of demarcation. Now we've taken the liberty of recording Mr. McFadden's presentation today so he can sit on the sidelines with me and answer questions real time. So by all means, utilize the question box in the webinar control panel at any time you want to ask a question. And I think Brian can get to it uh, even during the presentation. So let's see how folks have weighed in on this one. Very good. So again, thank you for very much for participating. And uh, at this time, we can start the uh, video. And we look forward to you uh, your questions as they come in. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on complete labeling for arc flash hazards. I'm Brian McFadden, a Compliance Specialist with Graphic Products. In this webinar, I'll talk about the key elements of arc flash labeling. First, a quick overview of the context behind these signs and what their goal really is. Then, the requirements from OSHA, the NEC, and NFPA 70E, and how those requirements interact. What the detailed labels described by NFPA 70E need to include and how to use EasyPower and a DuraLabel printer to create your own arc flash labels. First, I need to define a couple of big terms to give some context to the whole discussion. A hazard is a potential source of injury, damage, or loss. The sharp edge on a knife is a hazard. There are several hazards associated with electrical power. Arc flash is one of them. It's not always possible to get rid of hazards, and sometimes it's possible but not desirable. A knife without an edge isn't much use. Instead, we focus on risk. Risk is a complex evaluation of a hazard in a specific situation. Risk combines two elements, the severity of the potential injury or loss, and the likelihood of that injury or loss actually occurring. Risk can almost always be reduced, whether by making a potential injury less severe or by making it less likely to happen. However, you can't completely eliminate a risk unless you completely eliminate the underlying hazard. When it comes to electrical safety, that can be done by establishing an electrically safe work condition. With that condition in place, there's no risk of electric shock or arc flash because there's no electrical power. We've removed the hazard. An electrically safe work condition means that the equipment in question has been disconnected from energized parts, locked and tagged in accordance with established standards, tested to verify the absence of voltage, and 
if necessary, temporarily grounded, depending on the equipment and installation. There are some kinds of electrical work that simply have to be done live, troubleshooting and diagnostics, for example. But importantly, establishing an electrically safe work condition is itself live work because the condition hasn't been established yet when you go through those steps. In the real world, some kinds of live work, such as establishing an electrically safe work condition, will always involve the potential for arc flash, that is, an arc flash hazard. So how can we reduce the risk involved? Arc flashes happen very quickly. By the time a flash begins, it's too late to change what you're doing. So any steps we take to reduce the risk have to be done in advance. To be safe, workers need to be prepared. And to be prepared, they need to be informed. What information do workers need, then? Well, they need to know that a hazard exists, what kind of hazard it is, and how serious it is. And they need to know how to protect themselves from that hazard, which may include safe work procedures or requirements for personal protective equipment, or PPE. Some of this information is going to be provided through training or work experience, but a lot of it will be unique to the equipment and installation in question. In those cases, the best way to provide that information will often be with a sign or label posted to be clearly visible before work begins. By providing that information, we're helping the worker to prepare, which reduces the risk involved in their work. The right knowledge can save lives, and that's what these labels and signs are for. Arc flash hazard labels are also required by workplace safety laws. Here in the United States, OSHA's regulations only specifically mention arc flash at the utilities level, but several of their regulations for general workplaces also apply to arc flash, and these rules are going to be relevant for all of us. On the very basic end, OSHA requires electrical equipment in the workplace to be marked with voltage, current, wattage, or other ratings as necessary. This starts with manufacturer labels, but it doesn't end there because employers are responsible to provide the information needed for the use and maintenance of the equipment. Other ratings as necessary is pretty vague, though. OSHA gets more specific when it comes to hazards. Specifically, the law mandates the use of safety signs to warn and protect employees from hazards which could cause injury due to electric shock, burns, or failure of electric equipment parts. This clearly includes arc flash hazards, so labels or signs that warn workers about those hazards are necessary. Wherever a workplace hazard calls for PPE, another OSHA requirement comes into play. Employers must determine what PPE is needed, provide that equipment, and communicate the necessary information to employees. Working safely in the presence of an arc flash hazard requires PPE, so this rule also applies. For the communication part of the rule, labels are a simple and effective solution. Finally, there's what OSHA calls the General Duty Clause. This is Section 5A1 of the Occupational Safety and Health Act, the law created by Congress that gave OSHA most of its powers. The General Duty Clause says that employers have a general duty to provide a safe workplace, that is, one where risks have been reduced so that any hazards that exist are not likely to cause serious injury. The General Duty Clause is a guiding principle, and it brings us back around to the core reasoning behind arc flash labels. It's all in the interests of safety. OSHA focuses on safety in the workplace, but other legal requirements show up from different angles. In all 50 states, for example, some version of the National Electrical Code, or NEC, is mandatory at the state level as part of building codes. If your electrical installation isn't up to code, you have a problem. The 2020 edition of the NEC has two requirements for arc flash labels, both found in Article 110.16. Requirement A calls for general arc flash hazard warnings. Where electrical equipment that isn't in a dwelling is likely to need examination, service, or maintenance while energized, a marking is required to warn people about the potential for arc flash. No specific details are required here, but the code calls out that these warnings are intended to reach qualified persons, and they need to be visible before the examination, service, or maintenance is performed. Requirement B only covers service equipment rated for 1200 amps or more, and it requires more specific details. 
These signs need to identify nominal system voltage, available fault current at the protective device, clearing time for that device based on that current, and the date of the label. However, this label is not required at all if the equipment has a dedicated arc flash label that follows accepted industry practice. You can find these accepted practices in writing in another standard, NFPA 70E. NFPA 70E describes accepted practices for workplace electrical safety based on expert opinions and industry consensus, and it's updated every three years, most recently for 2021. It's published by the NFPA, the National Fire Protection Association, the same organization that publishes the NEC. This is the standard that defines the electrically safe work condition and how to achieve it, among other important topics. NFPA 70E dedicates a lot of its content to the topic of arc flash safety. It requires arc flash labels to include certain specific details that will inform safe choices when workers need to interact with the equipment. But before you can put detailed information on a label, you need to get that information from somewhere. Collecting that information is part of an arc flash risk assessment, described in Article 130.5. Within that process, there's an important section for identifying what PPE is really needed, and that section offers two different methods, analysis and categories. The analysis approach focuses on calculations, and it gives you exact details for your specific equipment in your specific installation. It's described in Article 130.5G, and there are several calculation methods available that follow this process. Essentially, this approach is determining the expected incident energy for an arc flash. Incident energy is the amount of heat energy that would hit a surface at a specified distance if an arc flash occurred. It's typically measured in calories per square centimeter. As an example, an incident energy of 1.2 calories per square centimeter is enough to cause second-degree burns, serious but still treatable. Higher incident energy means more total heat is applied to the surface, and you see a more destructive result. Once you know how much incident energy to expect, you know how much protection your PPE needs to offer to keep you safe. This energy spreads out as it gets further from the arc, so increasing the distance will decrease the incident energy. As a result, it's critical to specify the distance you're using for your calculations. This should be the so-called working distance, that is, the distance from the equipment to a worker's face and chest. It's often estimated at 18 inches, but the actual distance may be more or less depending on the equipment, installation, and task involved. This calculation approach gives detailed results, but can be complicated to use because it requires some complex math. There are several different calculation methods to choose from as well. The method that's generally considered the best is one published by the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, or IEEE, in their standard called IEEE 1584. It was most recently updated in December of 2018, with revisions based on extensive experimental testing. If you've used another method in the past, including the 2002 version of the IEEE standard, that's no longer following the best available science. Keeping your information up to date may require revisiting this analysis. While all the calculations can be done by hand or in a spreadsheet, specialized electrical analysis software like EasyPower can make this approach much easier. The other approach is a shortcut. Instead of doing a lot of math based on the exact details of your equipment, you can simply read a set of tables that the NFPA has prepared in Article 130.7 C15. These tables assign broad categories, numbered 1 to 4, to some recognizable situations. Each category corresponds to a standardized list of PPE items and ratings. If your equipment and installation are covered in those tables, all you need to do is find the entry that applies, and you can use the published recommendations for that matching category. However, the tables don't cover all possible situations, and if your installation isn't covered, then there's no way to meaningfully apply the category system. In that case, the shortcut isn't available, and you'll need to do an analysis. In the past, though, a lot of people tried to use both systems at the same time. 
calculating the incident energy, and then assigning an arc flash PPE category as well. This has been specifically prohibited in NFPA 70E since the 2015 edition, and there are several reasons for this. The systems approach their decisions in a different way. The PPE categories are based on the NFPA's conservative estimates for general scenarios. The incident energy calculations are up to the employer's detailed math for the exact equipment and installation being described, accounting for any protective systems or maintenance procedures that are in place. The two systems also give their results in different ways. A PPE category of four means you need the extremely protective spacesuit before you can work on the equipment safely. An incident energy of four means you need some standard thermal gear and a face shield, and you can leave all the heavy stuff in the tool room. A misunderstanding here could be deadly. Finally, equipment and installations can be changed over time, and the scientific understanding of arc flash is continuing to grow. In the future, you'll need to review and probably revise your arc flash safety systems. If you aren't sure where the old information came from, it'll be impossible to verify it and hard to update it. In general, if your project is small and uses only common equipment, the category approach may save time and effort. But for most cases, and especially with large or complex electrical installations, you'll need to use the analysis approach. Helping make that approach easier and more practical is one of the functions of software like EasyPower. Let's say you've collected your information and you're ready to move forward with creating labels. What details actually need to be on the finished label? The label requirements in NFPA 70E are listed in Article 130.5H, and they're the following elements. The nominal system voltage, the arc flash boundary, and at least one of the following, the incident energy and working distance, or the arc flash PPE category, but not both, the minimum arc rating of clothing, and or a site-specific identification of required PPE. First, there's the nominal system voltage, or the voltage class, for the equipment. This is usually the easiest detail to track down, and it serves as a quick and simple indicator for the power of a system. Next, there's the arc flash boundary. This is the stay back distance, how far away other workers should stay when work is being done on the equipment. Anyone who gets closer needs to have PPE that would protect them from the blast of heat from a potential arc flash. This boundary is defined as the distance from equipment where the incident energy from an arc flash would be 1.2 calories per square centimeter. That number represents when unprotected people are likely to get second degree burns. Crossing this boundary to get closer to the equipment triggers the requirement for PPE to protect against burns. That leads to a good question, what PPE is needed? The third requirement, that big section for at least one of the following, is really just a collection of ways to answer that question. Let's go one at a time. Option A looks the most complicated, but it's actually the most direct way to show the information that you collected earlier. If you used the PPE Categories shortcut, you can show the PPE category for this equipment. If you did the analysis to calculate an incident energy value, then you can show that incident energy and the working distance that it's based on. Naturally, you won't use both options at the same time, and trying to show both on the same label is not allowed. Option B, the minimum arc rating, is a more user-oriented way to give this same PPE information. The arc rating of a given piece of PPE indicates the maximum heat energy, conveniently in calories per square centimeter, that it can safely block or absorb. All arc rated PPE will be clearly marked with its AR number. This way, workers can compare the number on the label to the numbers on their gear, and know whether they're ready to work or need more protection. Experts often recommend this approach because it simplifies the job for the worker on site, it also allows you to make some informed decisions ahead of time, based on what equipment is actually available in the workplace. Finally, there's a catch-all option for any other system that works well for your facility and your workers. Some common choices here include an itemized list of required PPE elements, or a company-defined category system, like a color code. As long as the system is clearly identified and documented, and your workers are trained to understand it, you have a lot of leeway here. 
Those details, the nominal voltage, arc flash boundary, and PPE, form the core of an arc flash warning label. Some other details are often included on the same label, so we'll talk about those elements. It's helpful to have each label include the name or location of the equipment it applies to, especially if you're printing labels in a batch and then posting them later. Otherwise, you might end up with a handful of labels and no idea where they belong. It can also simplify updates in the future. NFPA 70E requires arc flash risk assessments to be reviewed at least once every five years, or whenever the electrical system is substantially changed. The standard itself is revised every three years. As a result, many electrical engineers and safety experts recommend following a three-year review cycle for risk assessments. As other standards, like IEEE 1584, are updated, you may need to perform additional reviews to ensure that your facility is using the most current recommendations. To help keep labels up to date, it makes sense to mark the date of the last assessment right on the label. In Canada, the relevant standard CSA Z462 specifically requires this, and it's become a best practice wherever arc flash labels are needed. Most equipment that poses an arc flash hazard also poses an electric shock hazard, and NFPA 70E discusses this as well. Since your facility's electrical safety program will need to address this hazard, and you're already putting a label on the equipment, it makes sense to cover both hazards at the same time. The basic system of shock protection under NFPA 70E is a set of stay-back distances around the equipment, like the arc flash boundary that we've already discussed. Workers should only cross these boundaries, getting closer to the equipment, under certain acceptable conditions. The standard assigns different boundary distances for different kinds of equipment and installations, based primarily on the voltage of the system. The limited approach boundary should normally be crossed only by qualified workers, that is, workers who have been properly trained and equipped for the task at hand. Other workers may cross this line as well, if necessary, as long as they are properly equipped and accompanied by a qualified worker. The restricted approach boundary, which is closer to the equipment, may only be crossed by qualified workers, and only when they have appropriate equipment or procedures to protect them from shock. The steps taken to protect workers within the restricted approach boundary should be documented. Finally, there's a recognized standard format for hazard signs, so it makes sense to follow that format for arc flash signs. ANSI Z535 from the American National Standards Institute is a widely used system focusing on consistency and clarity. Under the ANSI Z535 standard, these signs should be visible and legible before the reader is exposed to the hazard. That is, just like the NEC requires, the worker should be able to read the warning before work begins. Additionally, the reader of a sign should understand what the hazard is and what they need to do about it. For arc flash warnings, this typically means a brief statement that an arc flash hazard is present and that appropriate PPE is needed. The most recognizable element of ANSI Z535 is the boldly colored header along the top of each sign. Different headers are used for different kinds of hazards. The two headers typically used for arc flash labels are warning and danger. A warning label or sign has an orange header with a safety alert symbol, the exclamation point in a triangle, and the word warning in black. Warning signs describe a hazard that could result in serious injury or death if the sign is ignored. This description matches a wide variety of electrical hazards, so most arc flash labels use the warning format. A danger label or sign has a red header with the safety alert symbol and the word danger in white. Danger signs are for the most severe hazards, where serious injury or death are practically certain unless the instructions are followed. Some facilities use danger for arc flash labels where the incident energy is above a certain threshold value, often 40 calories per square centimeter. Whatever you decide, keep it consistent across your workplace. That consistency is an important point. If your labeling scheme isn't consistent across your facility, it will be harder for workers to recognize and understand your labels. In a similar vein, workers need to be trained on what to expect. To be qualified for electrical work under the NFPA 70E standard, a person needs to be able to identify and respond appropriately to the hazards they will be exposed to. Ensuring that workers will recognize the labels in their facility 
is a simple step in this direction. Once your labels have been created and printed, pay attention to the way that you post them. The right label on the wrong equipment can be worse than no label at all. And if workers have to put themselves in danger to read the label that warns them about that danger, there's a problem. After all, the whole point of the label is safety. Now that we've covered the context for ArcFlash labels, the requirements that apply to them, and how to make the decisions for what goes on to them, let's get practical. How can you actually create the labels you need? To make labels, you need to have your data and some way to arrange that data for printing. Then you need to have a printer and label stock to print on. For today, I'll show you the steps to use EasyPower for the data and software parts, and a Duralabel printer and supplies for the physical end of things. First, you'll need your electrical information. In EasyPower, you'll create your one-line diagram and fill in the details for your facility. Then, use the short circuit function to have the program run its analysis and do all the math behind the scenes. When the calculations are complete, you can view the results in a table format as the program's Arc Flash Hazard Report. For a lot of cases, this is the data you're looking for and you're done. But if you want to make labels, you can do that right in EasyPower very effectively. Just click the Label button up on the main toolbar. Here, you can choose a template for your label design, but we're going to make some changes to this design. Some experts in electrical safety have raised interesting ideas about simplifying labels. One of those suggestions is, where it makes sense for a facility, to consider using a standardized arc flash boundary rather than the exact calculated one. The goal of the boundary is to keep unprotected people away and mark where arc flash PPE is required. Having a boundary of 2 feet 3 inches for one piece of equipment, and 2 feet 5 inches for the next one, and 2 feet 4 inches for the next one, adds unnecessary complexity. Instead, you might choose to assign a boundary of 6 feet for all of that equipment. That's a more protective distance, and it's more practical to implement, and because it's more consistent, it's more likely to be followed. Of course, you do need to verify that this kind of decision will actually improve safety in your situation. So let's say, in our facility, we're going to use a general rule. All of our equipment that runs above 500 volts is going to use an arc flash boundary of 10 feet. We can make our labels reflect that company policy right here in the label editor. This template already has a field to show the calculated arc flash boundary. Select that field, and then look in the top right panel for the details of that field. If you scroll down through that panel, you'll see a line for visibility. You can make the visibility of this field conditional. We'll say this calculated boundary will be visible only if the voltage for the equipment is less than or equal to 0.5 kilovolts. Now we'll add a text field to the design that just says 10 feet, and then go to those same visibility controls for this new field. We want this one to be visible only when the voltage is greater than 0.5 kilovolts and we'll drag and drop that new text field to the right place on the label. In theory, what we've just done will make any label check to see if the voltage is above or below that 500 volt threshold. If it's above 500 volts, the label will show a standardized 10 foot boundary, and if it's below 500 volts, it'll show the calculated boundary. We can check that by selecting different devices on the left panel here, and it works, so our labels are ready to print. We're not just printing these labels on a normal office printer, though. Basic paper labels will tear, peel, and fade far too easily for long-term use. Safety signage needs to stand up to its environment. A sign that can't be read anymore doesn't serve its purpose or meet OSHA's legal requirements for safety information. For labels that last and look professional, you're going to want a better solution. Good labels will resist fading and smudging, stand up to wear and weather, and won't accidentally peel or tear away. Instead of replacing labels every few months or even weeks, you should expect a replacement cycle for your labels measured in years, ideally when you need to print new labels anyway, because the equipment has changed, your facility is renovated, or the standard is revised. The best printers for these kinds of situations use a printing process called thermal transfer, where a solid resin or ink is transferred from a supply ribbon onto a label stock. This gives a long-lasting print with excellent resistance to abrasion, water, chemical exposure, and temperature variation. 
the Duralabel line of printers from Graphic Products use this thermal transfer process. These printers were designed to make it cost-effective to create custom labels on-site and on-demand, and the same thermal transfer printers can also be used for other signs and labels, general safety signage, operating instructions, storage labeling, and so on. And when you're making arc flash labels, you can plug your Duralabel printer into your PC, just like you would with an office printer, and then print your label designs directly from EasyPower. In a few seconds, you'll have your finished labels ready to apply, and they'll be bold and readable for years. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar on arc flash labeling. My name is Brian McFadden, and I'm a compliance specialist with Graphic Products. We're proud to meet your needs for safety signage in the workplace with our Duralabel line of printers and our custom label printing service. We also offer a variety of free resources on OSHA compliance, industrial safety, and related concerns at graphicproducts.com. If you have any questions about what we've discussed today or how you can implement these approaches to improve safety in your facility, feel free to give us a call at 866-927-8573. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Thank you, Brian. That was a very good job. We've had several questions come in uh, during the presentation. Now's the time to finish up or to submit things that if we didn't cover during the presentation, we will be able to follow up via email. For those of you that haven't seen it, the uh, videos will be available of, on the Easy Power website and you will receive an email notice to that effect, as well as a certificate with attendance verification. Again, thank you for attending today, and we look forward to uh, your attendance in the future EasyPower webinars. Have a good day.